This is the eighth episode of the Coin Brief Podcast. Welcome, everyone. We've been doing this podcast for a few weeks now, and um, we will continue to report on the news in the cryptocurrency community as well as the Bitcoin space. Uh, the biggest development that happened this week in terms of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies as, as well is that the New York Department of Financial Services has issued some regulations uh, concerning transacting Bitcoin, buying Bitcoin, selling Bitcoin, and other digital currencies uh, in the state of New York specifically. And it's a 40-page document of proposed le- uh, regulations that were put out by the superintendent of financial services in New York, Ben Lasky. Um, he, he made a post on Reddit a while ago uh, summarizing it and asking for some input. And um, first of all, this is the most official set of regulations that have been put in place by any government really concerning digital currencies and um, so that's that's an interesting development but there's a lot of controversy because uh, some of the regulations are really um, prohibitive in terms of who can join the Bitcoin um, cryptocurrency space with a business or exchange Um, and, and and it it requires people to report on all kinds of things like the identities of customers, AML, KYC laws. Um, they have to record all the transactions that occur on the, on on their exchange and a whole host of, of, of really complicated regulations. It's a 40 page document. You can anyone can go out and uh, and read the whole thing for themselves or go to the Reddit post and see the summaries that some users have put up. And their criticisms. So here we are. Here we are in 2014, and governments are noticing Bitcoin, and they want to get involved with regulations, and kind of try and um, try and manipulate how people work in this space. So yeah, what what do you think, of Evan, about this development? Yeah, like, is this a good thing or a bad thing for Bitcoin? You know, because because like it. It's obviously a sign that Bitcoin has gotten big enough for New York, like the most tyrannical state government in the United States, mm-hmm. to to like crack down on it. But it's also gonna like pretty much kill the Bitcoin economy in New York if this stuff actually gets implemented. Yeah, yeah. Because these are some pretty ridiculous requirements, like. Uh, requires a bond held with the New York State, so you basically have to, you know, uh, loan money to the state government. Uh, you have to keep 10 years of records of business transactions. Like, uh, people yeah. who use Bitcoin care about their privacy, so they're, they're obviously not going to be happy about that. Um, virtual currency accounts not active for five years must be handed over to the state so like once again you have to give the state free money that's insane that's <laughs> insane that's theft right there <laughs> fingerprints submitted to the fbi i'm assuming these are uh fingerprints of uh the people who are running the businesses not the actual customers yes it's still pretty outrageous though yes background um, checks all that stuff Cybersecurity requirement requires security officer security plan audits and backup plan Jesus. <laughs> i don't even Look. know what that means but it sounds like it's going to cost a lot of money yep yep um and in marketing slash advertising you must include license to engage in virtual currency business activity by the new york state department of financial services so okay this so is free advertising right there for that department this, this is basically just like a complete government takeover of Bitcoin. And, you know, it, just, yeah. it goes against a lot of people in the Bitcoin community stand for. And I think it's going to pretty much strangle the Bitcoin economy in New York. Or, I mean, like the main, like the mainstream white market economy. You know, right. it, this is going to push Bitcoin underground in New York. Yeah. Um, I. At, with these regulations, it wouldn't be smart to even uh, open up a Bitcoin business in New York. You got to deal with all this. Um, if you, 
uh, if you have virtual currency accounts that haven't been active for five years, like let's let's here's an ex a specific example. Let's say that you deal with Bitcoin, Litecoin, Darkcoin, you know, a bunch of different virtual currencies, and let's say that you've got a Litecoin account, and Litecoin, you know, hasn't been doesn't get used much for the next five years or so. Let's say that Litecoin actually dies over the next five years. Um, it'll still be worth something, even if there's no community around it. But the the exchange will have to hand over all of their Litecoin to the government if they haven't used it for five years. Like, why? I don't understand why that would be necessary. Yeah, it's it would be like if, uh, you know, either the federal government or a state government passed a law saying that um, if you have a bank account that hasn't had any activity for five years, uh, you have to give all the money to the government. Or um, if you have if you have some gold that you bought and you've been keeping for five years and yeah. haven't sold yet, the government's going to come knocking on your door and they're going to take it from you. Yeah. Or cash that's, under your mattress. <laughs> yeah. That, that's exactly what this is. It's ridiculous. And this, there's not even any, like, any kind of context that I can imagine that would give them reason to do this. Like, it does nothing for consumer protection. It does nothing for, like, uh, like fraud prevention or insider trading prevention. It's just absolute theft. Like, if you don't spend this within five years, we're going to come take it from you. Mm -hmm. Like, the, you cannot fit that into any context and make it sound like it's being done to protect the people. Like, it, it's just blatant theft on part of the government. Yeah, like, there's a couple things in here that sound good in principle, that sounds like it would protect the consumer like the cybersecurity requirement requires a security officer security plan audits backup plan um so they're they trying to implement that to prevent another mount gox situation um force exchanges to have proper cybersecurity measures to prevent hackers from going in and stealing the funds but as as much as that's a good um ideal to to go for in terms of making exchanges better you can't force exchanges to do that um, if you do that's just creating a very high barrier to entry for all of them and it, it, it mandatory reviews every two years um, a lot can ch can happen in two years like what if you review it uh, in one particular year in 2014 and it's like oh well this particular exchange is is going great they're they're solvent they've got good cybersecurity Within just another year, all of that can change drastically, and look how uh, look how fast Mount Gox went under. It it took them uh, just a few months to go from being the main Bitcoin exchange to completely failing, no no funds to to pay people back their deposits, and that happened in just a few months. And the New York Department of Financial Services thinks they can actually monitor these guys every just every two years and and hope that that it's it's gonna make them um more more reliable for customers it's it's not gonna work it's good intentions yeah, it, but it's not gonna work it's just it's just to create the illusion that they're actually doing something when they're not really doing anything but yeah. i want to i want to go back to the cybersecurity requirement like this is going to be really expensive to comply with this requirement because uh, it says requires a security officer. I'm assuming that that means like an in-house security officer with the company right? Uh, who like oversees cybersecurity. So that's, that's somebody that no matter what, the government is forcing you to hire and pay, <laughs> even if you can't really afford it. A security Regardless plan, of whether the market actually requires that yeah. person. A security plan, once again, you're likely going to want to hire an expert to come up with a really great plan that the government is going to approve of. The, that kind of person isn't going to be cheap to hire. Uh, mm -hmm. Audits, so now you have to hire an audit team. Like every, cert, like every so often, you got to pay them. And a backup plan, which once again is going to require a cybersecurity expert or a cybersecurity team that you're going to have to pay. So... <laughs> So even yeah. just that one tiny requirement alone, even that is just going to make it completely like unaffordable 
for uh, a startup to do anything in New York State. Right, right, yeah. This is just raising the barrier to entry extremely high for new Bitcoin businesses and exchanges. And it's, I mean, not only does it make it, it, it very hard to get started in the space, but it's also going to make it extremely burdensome for people who want to work with these businesses, the customers themselves. AML, KYC requirements, there goes your privacy. Privacy's out the window. Uh, you, you have to um, basically tell the government exactly who you are, where you live, what you look like. And they're also going to have the, the entire list of transactions that you do with this company out of New York. So there goes privacy right out the window for customers in New York of Bitcoin exchanges. I think it's really, really stupid. Oh, here's enough. Here's another one I didn't see earlier. Must disclose a list of material risks uh, with dealing with virtual currency. For example, not legal tender, not backed by a government, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You might lose all of this. You might get hacked. The value might plummet to zero. Yeah, blah, 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 so, blah. so the the government is like basically uh, forcing these Bitcoin businesses to discourage people from using Bitcoin. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I, you know, the more I, the more I kind of look at this thing, it kind of seems like they're. This is actually kind of worse in some ways than outright banning Bitcoin because they know they can't outright ban it. So they, they're they just trying to force the people who do use it to 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 not promote it, to give the government their profits. That's that's another thing the, these exchanges and Bitcoin businesses aren't allowed to keep their profits for themselves. Oh, they yeah, I saw that, too. They can only put their profits into U.S. dollars or U.S. bonds, treasuries and stuff like that, or money markets. And you can't hold your profits in the currency that you work with? <laughs> it's completely absurd. Yeah, it's it's just a, a grossly blatant attempt to just kill it. Because, you know, like you said, they know they can't beat it with just an outright ban. So they're going to leave the opportunity for profit open. Uh, uh, they're just going to make it so that you can't use cryptocurrency to profit. You, yep. Cause you have to, you have to convert it into USD. Yeah. I, I mean, how are businesses even going to make any profit with all these rules? If you have to pay a security offer, you got to do all these audits and plans and, and you're basically required to have all these crazy expenses that weren't necessary before but now they're necessary now because the government is forcing you to protect the consumers in ways that weren't necessarily required before um how are they gonna make any money at all if they're trying if they're gonna try and comply with these regulations and if they do obviously they can't hold it in virtual currency so it's it's crazy. Yeah, so New York is it defeats is crazy. the purpose of virtual or, or digital currency. And if this be, if this becomes law, there will be no chance that we will ever get something like a like a Coinbase or a Bitstamp in New York, because uh, you know it's not it's not like those guys were rich to start with. I mean it's I mean I don't I don't know about their histories. They could be, but like um. Like this stuff is going to require millions of dollars, probably, or at least hundreds of thousands to become compliant. Mm -hmm. Like, um, like, like a lot of the small exchanges, especially the ones that deal in altcoins, not necessarily Bitcoin exclusively. You know, a start with nothing, and uh, they became what they are because they could put all of their resources into making their service better. Yeah, and not being you know compliant with some unnecessary law. So they're, they're just New York. If, if New York adopts this as law, they they're just going to completely eliminate any chance of having, uh, you know, any significant startup business that deals with Bitcoin in their state. Yeah, and here's another interesting thing from the regulations as well. Um, they any business or exchange that uh, that promotes or has any function at all. For like hiding transactions, or um, you know, making anonymous transactions, uh, 
they will not be compliant under these rules. Every single transaction has to, has to be has to be recorded. So things like uh, dark wallet, which is being uh, uh, coded by Amir Taki and Cody Wilson, stuff like that that anonymizes Bitcoin transactions. Any business that is even tangentially related to dark wallet in, uh, that is operating in New York won't be compliant under the law because it's not it's not um, it's not fully recordable uh, for the transactions a and other an anonymous coins like uh, dark coin uh, <laughs> I mean there's a there's a bunch of them at this point any exchange that allows people to exchange those anonymous currencies between each other you no nope, you're not complying either you, we, we got to watch all the transactions for every single currency <laughs> it's it's ridiculous i but i think that uh these regulations would actually encourage the use of things like dark wallet in new york because um because you know they're not they're not going to completely eliminate the bitcoin economy in new york with this regulation they would just push it on the ground so so then using things like dark wallet or dark coin um they, they would become necessities because uh because you know the only bitcoin business that would be going on uh would be black market business and be things like you know drugs and guns mm -hmm. cuz both of those things are highly illegal in new york mm -hmm. so so um really they're they're just setting themselves up to become like a capital in the bitcoin economy for you know the underground uh, for <laughs> bad things like yeah. Like you know, all all the all the drug dealers and gun runners are going to flock to New York now because that's where all the uh, underground business is. Because that's where because um, dark wallet is going to be really popular there. It's going to be really easy to use there, and you know they're not going to be able to do anything about that because dark wallet makes Bitcoin completely anonymous uh, just by default, yeah. and uh, so literally no way at all that you can track uh bitcoin as long as you know as long as you don't like don't purposely attach any of your personal information to it mm -hmm. um and the same thing with dark coin dark coin is a completely anonymous currency so yeah there's no way they can they would be able to track that down either <laughs> they're just hurting themselves in the long run so um, on the privacy issue i pulled up an article that was written by eric Voorhees today where he commented on the new New York regulations, uh, he he says that basically you will soon be unable to lawfully purchase a Bitcoin from any company that A, has any customers in New York, and B, doesn't keep an aggregated surveillance list of all customers, including name, address, photo ID, and other identifying information, regardless of the amounts transacted. So... Is is this basically the state trying to uh, completely bring the virtual currencies above board and and shining a light on on everything? And do, is 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 our projects like Dark Wallet really going to um, uh, uh, thrive like in the underground as people don't really want to uh, provide this identifying information? Yeah, I think I don't think they really care about bringing Bitcoin above board and making it legitimate. I think they just want to control it and they want to profit off of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and people who really care about doing uh, business in Bitcoin in the state of New York, like you know, for whatever reason they can't leave New York, maybe they can't afford it. But uh, but if they want to do business in Bitcoin bad enough, they're gonna do it. So they're gonna turn to to Dark Wallet, and uh, I mean this is this is exactly why uh, Cody Wilson and Amir Taki are making Dark Wallet is for you know situations like this. They saw this coming down the pipeline. So so black markets can thrive, uh, you, you know, even when the government is like actively trying to stamp Bitcoin out, it'll be able to thrive. So. Hmm. This is going to be like, it, it could, could, if this becomes law in New York, it could possibly end up being a great testing ground for a dark wallet. See how anonymous it actually makes Bitcoin. Yeah, that would be interesting. Um, like, I, I didn't 
even personally expect regulations to be this uh, this constrictive towards virtual currencies. And like I, I had liked the idea of Dark Wallet before and other anonymous coins or anonymous implementations of crypto coins. But now I really love the idea because like, I mean, in a way I thought that people like Cody Wilson and Amir Taki were kind of just like a little bit, you know, paranoid of, of privacy issues and stuff like that and how much of a problem it really is. But yeah, it's turning into a pretty big, yeah. pretty big problem, especially like right now, this is just in New York and the regulations aren't even final yet. They, there's like a 45 day, uh, like waiting period for comments and, and stuff like that. And for businesses to get up to speed, but if this gets like copied in other states and other states implement like similar regulations or if the entire United States government actually likes the implementation so much and, it, you know, puts it across the board will. for the whole country. Yeah. I mean, the Dark Wallet and other similar services will be absolutely necessary for anyone who wants to use the, the future of currency in a way that's anonymous and protects their privacy. But at the same time, that kind of scares me too, uh, because I don't I don't think you would really have a lot of like mainstream exchanges and things like that using Dark Wallet and like in like sheer defiance of the government. I, I think it would I think it would. The, these kinds of regulations would push Bitcoin so underground that it would be used for things like um, just like interpersonal exchanges, you know, like not not like buying things from Overstock, but like like um, if I write you an article or something and you want to pay me, you, you know, you're going to have to do it yeah. through Dark Wallet. Just ad and, hoc transactions, basically. Yeah, ad, ad hoc, an ad hoc economy uh, and things like drugs. Uh, still be like the reigning currency of choice for drugs and while i'm all for ending the drug war and um and you know like freedom of choice and everything like that i think drugs are bad i don't do drugs i don't think anyone else should do drugs so i'm not really excited excited about um the possibility of bitcoin being used only for you know small ad hoc uh and, drug, you know, the drug trade yeah you know yeah um, I'm of the opinion that, you know, depending on the drug specifically, um, it, it can act, it can either be very helpful medicine for some people, or it can be very harmful, um, uh, detriment to someone's life, depending on the drug and, and how they use it throughout their lives. So at, it's really more of a, um, it's a health issue in society. It's not a criminal issue. And, you know, there was a story that just came out last week recently as well where um, the NSA doesn't really spy on terrorists that much. They actually spend 90% of their surveillance looking for uh, drug trades and drug transactions. So, you mm -hmm. know, <laughs> people, people who just want to get high and alter their consciousness, it's, um, it's not a criminal issue. It shouldn't be treated as a criminal issue by any government agency. And, you know, projects like Dark Wallet, Open Bazaar, um, Dark Coin, all of these, like, who knows which one will be the most successful, but whichever one it is, it's going to really enable people to peacefully transact uh, for products that they were going to buy anyway, drugs and, and what have you, uh, do it peacefully in ways that don't threaten their safety, you know, out on the streets or whatever, or with dangerous drug dealers, and um, yeah, Dark Wallet's going to help that. Um, you know, New York State doesn't want to see that happen, though. They, they just they want to see everything that's, that's happening in the entire cryptocurrency space, and keep it all above board. But it's going to backfire, I think. It's going to backfire. Yeah, it's definitely going to backfire in New York, and um, you know, like we've been talking about, it's going to push everything underground, and Dark Wallet will thrive. Hopefully, if it works, I think it will work. Because uh, Cody Wilson's a genius, and he's work he's working with Amir Taki, so he, you know Taki must be pretty smart too. And um, 
But I honestly don't think the federal government is going to do anything like this anytime soon because uh, they really, I really don't think they seem that concerned with it because, uh, you know, they're pretty quick to wrongly consider it, classify it as property and um, apply the capital gains tax to it. Uh, so I don't think they're really doing that much research except yeah. for this little task force that the Federal Reserve has going on or something I wrote about a couple months ago. Haven't heard anything else from that. So it doesn't seem like they're very interested in it. They're probably more interested in, you know, just like making the numbers on the stock market go higher. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, let's, I, I want to, I want to talk about, um, mint pal for, for a minute. Mint pal is an exchange that, uh, allows people to trade digital currencies with one another. And they recently got their uh, some reserves of Veracoin stolen from their servers by hackers. All other crypto crypto coins on the site were fine, including Bitcoin, but the Veracoin was stolen. Um, so this is an example of you know an exchange being either incompetent or just just not protecting funds that well with cybersecurity. And this is the kind of thing that the New York State uh, Department of Financial Services wants to prevent, you know, people's coins getting stolen from a website. Um, do you think that these regulations would prevent anything like that from happening? No, I don't, I really don't think so. I think... I think it, these regulations would actually make something like this more likely because, how so? you, like, you, well, you know how we were, we were talking about earlier, it's just going to make it extreme, you know, a Bitcoin business in New York. Yeah. So if, if somebody does decide to base an exchange out of New York, and, uh, the, you know, they're probably going to be the only people who do that because you're going to, they're going to be the only people who have enough money to be compliant with the law. So you, we're, you would likely find yourself in a position where there's only one exchange in New York and uh, if it gets big enough, it's going to become a huge target uh, and it's going to be a pretty clear and obvious target too because it's the only one in the state. Right. So, right. so um, And you, that, that security officer that you're required to hire, he better be damn good at his yeah. job because yeah, you're going to so, be a big target in New York. Yeah, because I mean, the people who attack these, uh, who do these kinds of attacks, you know, they're really smart. Yeah. Like, you yeah. know, they're they're not idiots. So. Yeah. They probably if, see if, it as a job, right? They're they're hackers. Yeah. Their job is to hack and steal money. Yeah. So I mean, if if you set up a system where it makes it extremely likely, where only like one thing, like, for example, like only one exchange uh, can can operate in the state because it's the only one that can afford it you're just you're painting a big target on their backs but and uh and these hackers they're gonna like they, they know that there's gonna be a bunch of money in there um and so they're yeah. gonna devote all their time to cracking the security and it's gonna happen eventually and there's and a chance be... they'll know exactly how much money is in there because of all the reporting that's required of these exchanges yeah so and... hackers will be able to look there and be like oh they have they have thirty bitcoins on their servers right now, or they yeah. or they did a couple months ago when they reported that. I'll just go in there and try and steal those right now. Yeah, and the, and then the hackers are going to use dark wallet, and they'll be yep. gone forever. <laughs> yep. Um. Yep. So yeah, it's pretty it's pretty ridiculous. But I just want to say about about Mint Pal. Uh, I should probably. Uh, look up some updates on it, but uh, after it happened, they said that MintPal said that they were working with the Veracoin development team and all the other major altcoin exchanges to create a hard fork in Veracoin's blockchain. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, like, if the, if the fork is successful, it would allow them to uh, retrieve all the stolen coins and, uh, and uh, you know, just basically, like, reverse the whole attack. Wow. Um, I haven't I haven't heard anything about whether or not that that happened or if or if it was successful. Um, I'm definitely going to be looking into that and you know providing an update on Coin Brief once mm -hmm. I find that information. But yeah, yeah, that would be so, huge. That that would be a a fantastic example of an exchange actually regulating itself 
and uh, and trying to get the money back to people in a pretty um, interesting way. You can't really do that with Bitcoin, kind of rewinding the blockchain or whatever. But with Vericoin, I guess it, they're still relatively small enough, and the the theft happened recently enough where they can rewind the blockchain and possibly get it, everyone's money back. Yeah. So you know, Mint, Mint Pal and and Vericoin and uh, apparently a lot of other altcoin exchanges, uh, they're working on getting the Vericoins back. You know, like I said, I don't know if they've actually done it yet. I need to look that up. But, you know, what really sucks about this is that MintPow is the biggest uh, altcoin exchange that there is. They're pretty good. I've uh, used them. Um, Dustin told me that, um, that MintPow sees two to three times the trading volume as Cripsy, which is, you know, another really popular altcoin exchange. Mm. So, you know, so MintPow is pretty big. So, you know, this is pretty... Uh, it's a pretty big blow for them and for you know the altcoin yeah. communities because you know they're like the most popular exchange is no longer secure. Yeah, it's kind of a tarnish on their record a little bit, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they're working on it. You know, they they're ramping up their security measures so it doesn't happen again. You know, doing working on the hard fork. So I mean, they're not just letting it happen. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Self regulation is fantastic. And the reason why you're seeing that uh, happen more often these days is just the sheer number of exchanges that have that have popped up um, to to compete with each other and try and offer the best possible services to people. And that happens completely without any government regulation, completely yep, organic. Because it's all it all comes down to maintaining your profits, you know. And if you want to maintain your profits for a long time, like all businesses do, of course. Um, they're going to do whatever they can to satisfy the market. Like, not that hard of a concept, but, mm -hmm. you know, some people in the government just don't, like, they they either don't just can't understand it or they don't want to accept it because it means losing their power, but, you know. Right. E either way, they're ruining the economy. <laughs> hey, don't worry, don't worry. We uh, People like us, people working in the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency space, uh, we're just building our own brand new economy that doesn't yep, depend we're just, on the old. We're just going to replace theirs. We're just going to replace theirs with ours. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, <laughs> random tangent for a second. Um, like back in 2008 when the economy crashed, uh, the banks got bailed out. Uh, you know, everyone thought that we were going to head into a brand new depression. Um, looking back on that now, uh, Nothing was done to prevent that from happening again in the government. The banks are still in bed just as much with the with the government. And um, it's very likely that we're in another stock bubble right now. Stocks have been rising. Oh, we definitely are. Yeah. And we're very likely going to see a crash soon for the same reasons as before. But uh, you know what? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to this brand new economy that's popping up for cryptocurrencies and we don't need to rely on the government to regulate financial institutions and make them so-called safe for us because when they start doing that it just creates extremely high barriers to entry for new participants in the market and it also makes the current participants who have already gotten an established business it just makes them um, more reliant on the regulations to hold their monopoly and their influence on the market. So we're making progress. Yep. Definitely within the next few years, possibly even sooner, uh, you know, we're going to start, we're going to slide back into recession. Um, well, I mean, in the real world, we never left the recession, but, the, you know, the stock market is obviously through the roof right now. And so, uh, you know, the people who are already rich are getting even more rich. But, um, but that's not going to last forever. It's going to last for a few more years at the most. And and then uh, they're gonna we're gonna start sliding back into a recession. Hmm. It's, it's gonna it's gonna look a lot like the 1970s uh, stagflation where wages were stagnant but prices were through the roof, and uh, people are gonna turn to gold and Bitcoin. And so anybody who's holding a substantial amount of both are they're gonna be really well off in a few years. Uh huh. Would you apply that as well to you know other metals like silver? And also, would you apply it to other cryptocurrencies? Yeah, definitely. Silver always goes up with gold. Uh, 
because it's like silver is like the secondary the, the secondary uh currency Just, to gold yeah. you know it's, it's like it's like silver gold's is the little, silver to gold's gold <laughs> yeah it, it's like it, it, silver is like gold's little brother you know uh so ah so so like when when gold used to be used as money instead of instead of you know pieces of paper uh the really big uh, transactions would be used in gold. Like if you're buying something that costed like a hundred bucks, you'd pay for it with gold. And then, but if it was like, you know, a hundred dollars and like fifty cents, you'd pay, you know, the fifty cents of silver. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. so, uh, so anytime gold goes up, silver goes up too, because you know they're just linked together like that, because uh, they've always been used together, and Bitcoin. Bitcoin is just like a you know like a really awesome version of digital version of gold, so of course it's mm -hmm. gonna go up. Um, but, but what as far about as other like, altcoins like yeah, Litecoin, Darkcoin? As far as other altcoins, uh, like especially Litecoin, uh, you know I don't really know because uh, you know you don't really need to have. Um, a less valuable cryptocurrency because you can break Bitcoin down to eight decimal right. places. Yeah, but there's a hundred million satoshis in a Bitcoin. Yeah, but um, Litecoin could always go up, or another cryptocurrency could always go up. Um, may you know maybe in the emerging markets where the people are poor and the population is higher, so they need you know maybe. A less valuable currency, but it has a higher supply. You know, Litecoin would be good for that because there's a much higher supply. There, there are much, a lot more of it than than bitcoins. So, but really, I think the only way that an altcoin is going to like skyrocket along with Bitcoin is if it is, um, you know, successfully competing head to head with Bitcoin. Like, like it offers something that Bitcoin doesn't offer. Yes. You know, so like. So like maybe Darkcoin, which makes it completely anonymous, where you know Bitcoin is really like kind of only pretend anonymous, you know, and unless you unless you do it right, yeah. you know, um, or you know, or something like that. But who knows? I mean, it could be a possibility that once Bitcoin skyrockets, people get more interested in altcoins, um, especially yeah. you know like the secondary ones that aren't meant to compete with Bitcoin directly. You know the ones like Redcoin or Dogecoin or something. Mm. You know people people who get in on Bitcoin might be interested in investing in those smaller coins, yeah. um, and then those could go up too. You know. Yeah, you know I like it's it's really hard to predict. You know the action, the price movements of altcoins, even more difficult in some ways than predicting Bitcoin price movements. But like, I, it seems like a lot of value that people place into particular altcoins depends on their branding, not necessarily with their actual functions. So like, for example, um, with Litecoin, Litecoin was obviously the successor or the, the second Bitcoin. Back then, people were saying Litecoin is the silver to Bitcoin's gold. Uh, it'll it'll be used to transact in smaller amounts. It'll it'll be used for microtransactions. You know, less valuable payments. Save Bitcoin while spending Litecoin. Stuff like that. And um, it it hasn't exactly panned out that way. Like if you want to pay in small amounts, Bitcoin is still perfectly fine for that. And you know, Litecoin has experienced a pretty significant drop over the past few months in 2014. And I think it's because that uh, the idea that Litecoin is the silver to Bitcoin's gold, that's just that's just a marketing slogan at the end of the day. And the fact that the Litecoin logo itself is silver, like they're obviously they were obviously trying to position themselves as the silver to Bitcoin's gold. Um, and then there's Darkcoin, which markets itself itself as anonymous. Um, you know, Purecoin markets itself as you know the um it's it's environmentally friendly because it doesn't use as much processing power um but like it's hard to find one that actually has really good features that complement bitcoin um you know name coin is is an example of that something that actually makes something 
different than Bitcoin does. Because Bitcoin, it actually, Bitcoin is a is a is a pretty good. Um, it's a revolutionary currency, and to make something that is a better currency than Bitcoin, um, at this point, that's really really hard to do, especially considering the head start that Bitcoin has had and the network effect of spreading to merchants and industry insiders around the world. So, you know, it's possible that we might see altcoins rise again. Um, but I think it, it would only be because of, of marketing reasons, if they market it correctly, or if it provides something truly revol re revolutionary in terms of, um, you know, in terms of functionality. But we haven't seen that yet. Yeah, I actually wrote an article about um, an altcoin's role in a world that was dominated by Bitcoin, where Bitcoin was the, you know, exclusive currency, number one currency of choice in the world, mm -hmm. and um, and I think really that's the only way an altcoin would thrive alongside Bitcoin, because you know, um, obviously if we're considering a world where everyone uses Bitcoin, it's going to be you know well into the future. So the population is going to be uh, extremely high. You know, you know, several tens of billions of people on the earth. There's only 22 million bitcoins. Um, a lot of those are in wallets that will never ever be used again because they were lost back when it was you know worthless and nobody cared about it. Yeah. So um, there's a very small amount of bitcoins. And it's possible that the population could increase to the point where even even if you start using satoshis as an everyday uh, as an everyday uh, unit monetary unit, uh -huh. there would still be more uh, way more people on Earth than there are satoshis. So then we can con like we could conceive of a world where like um, where like back when gold and silver was used, you know the 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 rich industrialized countries use gold while the developing countries use silver that would kind of be how like how it would look in this world like you know the richer the the richer communities would use bitcoin uh where you know the poor communities that have like really huge populations and really poor economies would use something like litecoin because the the litecoin supply is much like I think there's several billion litecoins that can be mined. Um, so while it may like never be as valuable, it'd be more accessible, and it would help poor people get off the ground, and then they could eventually start using Bitcoin. But in like re like in the real world today's economy, like if we look at it realistically, there's just not really any use for something like Litecoin. You know, like um, yeah, I I think I think right now. Uh, in the in the short term, not looking at like a hundred years into the future, but like you know five or ten years from now, the only altcoins that are gonna like be worth anything are gonna be the ones uh, that aren't like trying to compete directly with Bitcoin. You know, like I said, maybe like Redcoin or you know something else like Redcoin. I don't know. And, it's um, trying to be the social currency, right? Yeah, yeah. Like they're they're not really trying to like beat bitcoin they're not trying to compete with it they're just using the idea of, of of cryptocurrency to make something you know to make something new and those are going to be the coins that have value in in the future and uh things that were created to compete with bitcoin namely litecoin they're just they're probably not going to be around much longer wah, wah, wah. <laughs> <laughs> all right well good luck altcoins uh more power to the ones that actually do something interesting with the technology. Okay, so um, so that that pretty much covers it for altcoins. Um, there's some other random news that happened this week. Uh, small little developments that happened in the space. Uh, for example, uh, Google has teamed up with Coinbase to show the Bitcoin price uh, on Google when you search, you know, Bitcoin price on the search engine. So. There you go. <laughs> now anyone who's curious about the Bitcoin price, people who are just barely getting into it, who don't know that much about it, if you search it on Google, Google will conveniently provide you with the current exchange rate uh, based on Coinbase. So um, that's 
pretty interesting. I think it shows that Google is very open to, to the idea of Bitcoin. We already know that certain executives like Eric Schmidt um, like the idea. But now we're actually seeing some kind of some cohesiveness, some interaction uh, between Google and Bitcoin uh, cryptocurrency companies in trying to promote awareness, uh, spread, you know, information about Bitcoin itself. And hopefully this leads to more more alliances between uh, major tech companies and uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin businesses. So you think it's a big deal? Um. Yeah, I think it's pretty significant. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's that's pretty much it, right? It, yeah. it just added the price to the search engines. It's, it's. I mean, it's on Google. Anybody can look it up. Like, uh, that's that's all there is. Yeah. It, it'll it'll be it'll be cool because like anybody who's interested in Bitcoin would be able to, uh, you know, they're gonna see the price. So like, as soon as they start learning about Bitcoin, they're gonna be immersed in the markets. They're yeah. going to be immersed in the exchange. They're going to be watching the price move. And they're hopefully going to be amazed by that, by how much it can go up in a short period of time. Yeah. And they're going to be more happy to get into it. Time. Yeah, or, or down. Yeah. But that's that's part of the fun, too. Yeah, it is. Um, So it basically, it, I mean, it really gets it out there more. And, you know, that's really all there is to say about it. But I just found a new, um, or a story from yesterday uh, published on Coindesk. Uh. There was a Bitcoin mining summit, and Ghash has pledged to uh, has pledged to restrain themselves and not go above forty percent hash rate. Okay, great. Do you think they're actually gonna do that? <sighs> well, the thing is, I, haven't they made like a promise like that sometime in the past, and they still went over forty percent? Like they would, they. S- should we they trust them? They said that um, I don't trust them. They they said that uh, they have really great security and that nobody would ever be able to to get into their uh, servers mm-hmm. and that nobody on the inside would ever try to double spend. I, I'm pretty sure this is the first time they've ever put an actual cap on their hash rate. Um, but when I saw this yesterday, the first thing that came to mind was that oh well. You know they're just they're just gonna put they're they're just gonna have as much um as much hashing power as they want and anything over forty percent they're just going to uh, put they it in like the sell it or something no th- they're gonna put it in the the other section like if if you go on blockchain uh if you go on blockchain info and you look at like the little pie graph of you know the various pools and their um and their hash rates. There's this one. There's this pretty significant uh, chunk that's labeled as unknown, and um, yeah. yeah. So you can so you can like you, you can like uh, be mining independently and not like be pointing your your uh, your rigs at any uh, particular pool, and I guess would be considered unknown. And so what Ghash mm. can do is that is they can just. Um, they can just take some of the miners and like, um, I don't know exactly how they how they would do it, but it would show up as not being uh, ghash hashing power. It would just show up as being unknown. Uh, and, okay. And that happened that happened recently when they when they got when they broke fifty percent and everybody got really upset about it and they said, oh no, don't worry guys, we're gonna fix this, we're gonna fix this, and then the hash rate went down, but the you know the portion of the hashing rate that was in this unknown label went up proportionate to the decrease in ghash's hashing power okay so they can always do that and look like they're under 40 percent but control you know 70 percent of the hashing power yeah so Could, I, like if someone uh gained access to the ghash.io servers um, could they still you know take that whole 70 percent and use that to execute a double spend attack even yeah, if there's but, only forty percent that are technically actually on Ghash. Yeah, because um, because even though it shows up, it, even though it doesn't show up as being controlled by Ghash, uh, you know they still control that hashing power. Like um, you know, it's still it's still in their servers under their control. It's just it's not being reported under their name. You know, 
like I said, I don't know exactly how it works. I'm not, you know, an expert on Bitcoin mining, but, you know, they can do that somehow. Um, I'm sure there's a bunch of people on Reddit who can explain it way better than I can. Yeah. Um, but basically, they, they know how to do this, and it looks like they did it, you know, a few weeks ago when the whole, you know, ruckus was going on. So yeah. definitely, I, w- I wouldn't trust this promise. Um, there has was, to be a long-term solution. This is great for yeah, short term, but we've got to do something better in long term. Yeah, I, w- I would say we should, you know, continue encouraging miners to use P2 pool, which is a decentralized mining pool uh, that has, you know, like no overhead authority that controls all the hashing rate. So there, even even if P2 pool does get fifty one percent, they don't really have fifty one percent because nobody can come in control of it mm. um, and then you know we should always be pursuing a really really permanent solution which is modifying protocol the, the so code, yeah. it's impossible to get over 51 percent yeah that's harder to do though because um, we, we have a bunch of different uh, computer scientists who work on the Bitcoin code and not all of them get paid for their work not all of them you know work all the time so getting changes done to the bitcoin code itself it's a very long uh process of of getting consensus between multiple people who have influence over that area but um ideally we do need something like that because this is a major flaw in the bitcoin system where if someone gets over 51% of the hashing power on the network, they technically have the ability to spend a transaction twice, which basically is duplicating the money, counterfeiting it, uh, creating it out of thin air. And it wouldn't necessarily destroy the network, but it would debase the trust in the network significantly. So in the short term, we'll hope that Ghash you know, manages their... their um, their reserves right and and you know keeps it keeps their actual mining mining power below 40 percent and i guess yeah we just have to trust them for now and in the long term uh hope that something is done to the code that prevents this permanently so yeah yeah the perfect the perfect solution is to fix the code but what we can realistically do right now is decentralized mining pools yeah, do you know? Do you know any miners personally? Because uh, I, I, I don't. I used to know a Litecoin miner a couple of years ago, but I haven't been in contact with him recently. I don't know if he still mines Litecoin or if he does something different. But yeah, like anyone watching this, if you know any miners personally, like you know, just mention it to them in passing. You know, try and see if they're willing to change to P two pool. And even if it's a little bit less profitable for them, uh, try and make the argument that it's for the good of the Bitcoin network overall. And if you really want this to succeed as an alternative currency system that is long lasting and reliable for everyone, we have to pursue mining decentralization on all fronts. Yeah, and I don't think P2 pool is less profitable uh, because... the reason why Ghash got so huge was that they um, they offered some kind of zero percent rate on some fee that other uh, that other pools had, you know, like a significant percentage uh, rate. And so, uh, you know, a lot of miners flocked to Ghash because you know they didn't have to pay whatever this fee is. I don't know exactly what it is, uh, but P two pool has the same zero percent rate on that fee. So. Um, I think it can be just as profitable, actually. So yeah, if if anybody knows a miner personally, or they know somebody who's considering building a rig, encourage them to point it at P two pool if they're if they're considering a mining pool. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. I mean, certainly, if I had three thousand dollars to throw around, I would certainly buy a mining rig and point it towards P two pool just to support the network and you know, of course, mine some bitcoins. But uh, you know, it's it's important to pursue mining, decent, mining decent, decentralization. So, yeah, good uh, good good ideal to pursue. This has been the eighth episode of the Coin Brief podcast, 
and uh, so any any viewers, we're getting we're getting up there with viewers on YouTube. So if anyone watching this has some suggestions for us to improve our show, um, uh, we're definitely open to them. And uh, I w I definitely want to make this show as good as it possibly can be. I want it to be very informative um, for people watching it. Pretty soon we will be bringing on uh, guests to interview people from the industry, prominent members of the community, just talk about issues, talk about new products that are coming out, and new possibilities in the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency space. So that should be really interesting. Uh, Evan, you you won't you won't be here next week, is that correct? That's right. I'm gonna be on vacation, and I won't have internet access. Okay. So I'm not going to be on the show next week. Off the grid. Off the grid. Huh? Yep. Off the grid. <laughs> nice. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to I'm gonna see if I can get um, a guest on to interview next week. Still to be determined who's that's, who that's going to be, but it should be really interesting when it happens. And I um, hope you guys tune in. And, uh, well, not really tune in. You're, watch, you're, you're on YouTube watching this. So just click, <laughs> click the <play>. link. <laughs> and, and subscribe. Yeah, and subscribe to us too, and comment. You know, give us feedback, all that good stuff. Um, I'm Sean Wintz. I'm on Twitter at Crypto Sean. Uh, I talk about uh, you know recent news that, that interests me on on my Twitter account, and I also promote my articles on there. Also, go to my actual articles page on Coinbrief.net. Uh, the page is Coinbrief.net uh, slash author slash Sean W. And um, yeah, we'll we'll keep doing this. Evan, you wanna you wanna close out with your information? Uh, I don't have Twitter, because uh, I don't like it. But since we're doing this whole podcast thing now, and it's getting some viewers, I might consider making a Twitter. Keep you updated on that. Looking forward um, to it. Uh, yeah, you can find me on Coin Brief too. Obviously, I write an article pretty much every day. I cover I cover everything from. You know, everyday news to uh, Bitcoin price analysis. Uh, I make I make predictions for what the price is going to be in the near future. Been right every single time so far. So make sure you read my uh, my articles that analyze the markets. Mm -hmm. You also and, have really uh, good discussions about the economics and um, yep. you know philosophical aspects of Bitcoin. Yep, I I have been looking into. Uh, for I mean, just just so everybody's watching knows, I've been teaching myself economics in my spare time for about a year now. Um, by no means an expert, but I like to think that I know a pretty good bit about economics, Austrian economics at least. And so um, I've been exploring the theoretical implications of Bitcoin. Where does the value come from? Uh, like, how how would Bitcoin work in certain situations? Uh, things like that, and. Um, they get pretty good feedback, so I guess they're pretty interesting. So you know, read yeah. those if you want. Yeah, I'd agree. So yeah, that pretty much uh, covers it for this week's episode of the Coin Brief Podcast. This has been episode number eight. And um, yeah, we'll see you guys next week with some more news and developments in the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency community.